Hello and welcome to your Henry the First video for our A level history course. Um, sorry about the, the delay in, in getting uh, videos to you recently. Um, I've explained that I think via email. So we're going to crack back on by looking at Henry the First. And um, we haven't got much to, to finish off with. I've been umming and ahhing about uh, what to set you over the, the half term break. I am going to set you something. It is going to be a 20 marker. Um, it's it's one that's going to ask you to, to revise back a few different topics so I'd like you to have that done um, for the first week back and we probably should be finished with, with Henry the first by the end of that first week back so what we're going to look today is 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 look at Henry the first relationship with uh, Archbishop Anselm who obviously we've looked at already when we've we've looked at William the second so we're going to describe it and um, the causes and the events of something called the lay investiture controversy which is going to dominate the relationship between Henry and Anselm. We're then going to look at how Henry was able to end this controversy and, and try and pass some judgment on Henry the first diplomatic abilities at this point. The 20 marker that we're going to be looking at um, over the half term break is, is going to ask you to look holistically at William the first, William the second and Henry the first. So you're going to have to do some revision on this one. Um, it's an open book assessment, so you don't have to do it under exam conditions whatsoever. And I'd like this uh, back uh, on the first Thursday um, of, of the first week back. So that's the fourth. If there are any problems with that, you've got to email me first. I don't want people on, on the fourth not to just submit it. If you're having issues, you've just got to let me know. The question is, how far was the English church reformed in the years 1066 to 1106? So we're looking at the relationship between uh, the church and the three different leaders and, and how I would structure it is do three separate paragraphs one on William the first one on William the second one on Henry the first and for each one talk about whether or not the church was reformed during their particular period we know that there's some you know resisting um, practices by the, the English kings at this time so what we need to do is we need to talk about how far uh, we saw reform in each particular uh, time frame so for that first King William the First. We've obviously got to look at Archbishop Lanfranc's reforms, um, but you've also got to consider William the Second's relationship, and finally Henry the First relationship, which we'll look at today. In terms of where we are, um, these are the final few topics, and as we said, we were going to look at William the Second and Henry the First in a more chronological approach. We've we've done a lot of the the information. We've obviously already finished on William the Second. We 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 started our, our, our topic on Henry the First. Today we will finish uh, state, church, and society for Henry uh, the First. That means that we we only have to look at uh, Henry the First relationship with Normandy and specifically Robert of Normandy uh, after this particular point. That that will take two lessons. So we'll be done by the fourth of of June. So um, the issue that we're, we're mainly focused on today is, is something called lay investiture, which sounds quite complicated and it is really important that you know what, what exactly the definition is. So if it's not quite clear from this video, take a, a, you know, a minute or so, go on to Google, type it in. There's plenty of definitions that you can find there, but if you are unsure, just contact me back. Lay investiture is, is really uh, summarized really by this picture. So if you have a look at this picture, on the left hand side, you've got a medieval king. And on the right hand side, you've got a bishop or an archbishop. And you can see that there, there appears to be the passing of a staff from the king to the bishop. Now, this is a symbolic process, and this is what lay investiture is. It's the symbolic act of a king giving a staff or a ring or another object to a bishop and that that process that passing on of that staff or that ring is the confirmation of his appointment so for example king wants this particular bishop to rule over this particular area there has to be this symbolic process of lay investiture so that that bishop can be uh, given that particular title of let's say archbishop of canterbury or archbishop of york or bishop of worcester the king has to have that particular process of lay investiture. Now, the kings of Europe at this particular time wanted this practice to continue. Um, bishops were also tenants in chief, so they were also landowners. And this practice of lay investiture confirmed their homage and their loyalty to their king. We know people like Bishop Odo of Bayo, they're not just focused in on the church, they're focused as, as landowners, as warriors. And through this process, you are confirming their loyalty to you. So it, it 
reinforces that feudal model uh, that we looked at when we, we looked at William I. By the latter end of the 1090s, however, the church, and particularly the, um, the church in, in Rome um, and in, in southern France, are questioning this practice. They don't like how much influence the kings are having over the church. And we'll see this dominating uh, lots of, of relationships for, for the 12th century across Europe. What the church want is they want the, the church themselves to hold the power to appoint bishops. So the Pope, for example, would want this particular bishop to be the Archbishop of York and pass that particular power. So his men and uh, his bishops are dotted all around Europe and they're not being confirmed by the kings. Now, the Papal Councils of Clermont in 1098 and Barry in 1099 had specifically condemned this practice of lay investiture. They wanted the Pope to have this particular power. And it's not just England that is, is the only kingdom to be condemned on this. So the, the most famous um, uh, empire that's, that's condemned uh, during this investiture controversy uh, is the Holy Roman Empire, which is um, it kind of makes up the, the landmass that today is known as Germany and, and Austria or Central Europe. So that's what lay investiture is. And like I say, if you're a bit unsure about that, take a bit of time, do your research, just make sure that you've got that definition of that. So with Henry I and with Anselm, they're, they're embroiled um, in this particular crisis. 1099 is where um, the, the Council of the Papal Council of Barry uh, has specifically condemned this practice. And in 1100, we know that Henry I uh, becomes King of England. Archbishop Anselm, we know, has been in either voluntary exile or forced exile since 1090, um, 1096. And as a consequence, they're going to be embroiled in this particular crisis. So we have to think about what Henry needs during 1100. Um, because it's not as straightforward to just say he wants exactly those things on the previous slide. He does want to, to maintain the practice of lay investiture. It's within his interests as a feudal lord. But he also needs the following things. He needs allies. He's a usurper king. Um, he's taken the throne opportunistically. Um, so he needs as many allies as he possibly can have. And, and the, you know, the ally of the church is going to be an incredibly powerful, rich and influential ally. He needs to have the reputation of being a God-fearing leader. That's desirable at this particular time. It's desirable for a number of reasons, but predominantly it, it's down to the fact that he wants to confirm his legacy. Men of the church write the annals of history. They're the people that are writing uh, about the kings and the reputation of these particular kings. So if he sides with the church, then his reputation and his legacy are secure. But also, they're the people that can legitimise his reign. They're the people that are going to be writing lots of these documents. How are they going to talk about Henry I? Are they going to talk about him as an evil man that has opportunistically taken the throne? Or are they going to talk about him as the saviour uh, over the scourge of William II. And finally, we don't know necessarily the, the plans of Robert of Normandy by 1100. Remember, he's returning from the Holy Lands um, at this particular point. An exiled or a disgruntled archbishop could be exploited by Robert of Normandy, could be taken under the wing of Robert of Normandy, and that again could be a powerful enemy uh, that Henry I doesn't really need at this particular point. For Archbishop Anselm, well, what does he need at this particular point? Well, he needs a responsible role to act as a moral guardian. This is a man that is devoted to the church. We know how devoted he is to church reform, and we know how passionate he is about this. And in order to enact all of this church reform, and in order to enact his role as a moral guardian, he needs to have a clear leadership role. And, and therefore, he's, he's not desperate, but he's, he knows how important it is for, for him and for the church to guide England through this particular period. Um, and having been in exile for a number of years, he needs to have uh, this role. So what happens then between Henry and Anselm? Because we know what controversy there is about lay investiture. We perhaps would imagine what William II might have done during this lay investiture crisis. Obviously, he wouldn't have, have worked with it. He would have, he would have opposed it. But with Henry and Anselm, the circumstances and the context is different. So what we now need to see is what the two of them do. And what they do is they show pragmatism. And they have to show pragmatism um, in order for, for both of them to survive. So 
this is a decision which isn't necessarily born out of their complete desires and wishes, but out of the circumstances of 1100. So what they do is they decide to put this issue of lay investiture on hold when uh, Henry and Anselm um, decide to, to come to, to England and, he, and in respect to being king and archbishop. They refer the matter to the new Pope, Pope Paschal II, to, me, uh, to mediate whilst the two work together. And in that meantime of, of while Pope Paschal II is mediating on the issue of England, Matilda is crowned as queen by Archbishop Anselm, and Anselm persuades magnates to, to come to rally around Henry in 1101. Obviously, the, the issue isn't um, completely finished. It's, it's not something that's uh, decided upon in just those first two years. This is an issue that's going to, to continue for the next six. So the next six years we can characterise as negotiating a deal between the church and, and Henry. And a deal is reached and, and a compromise is made um, and as such Henry is able to survive with the support of the church and he's able to secure the legacy which he receives from the various different chroniclers of the time. So we need to understand how that, that deal is, is made and what happens over that six year period. Now you've got a form of a living graph and um, you can write it like a timeline if you prefer. Um, but I've given two different um, spaces um, so you can decide what you want to measure your living graph on if you decide to do that. So in 1101, um, the Pope urges Henry to give up lay investiture. Um, and it's done in, in a formal manner now. So now, after these first two years of Henry securing himself as King of England uh, are out the way, the Pope is now making this an issue. But in that particular request, there isn't a reference to the issue of homage, which we know is, is part and parcel of the lay investiture process. Uh, you know, the King gives uh, investiture and also um, requests homage in return as the Bishop is usually a tenant in chief. Henry ignores this particular request. He doesn't do anything about it. And what decides what they decide to do in 1102 is they decide to send a mission to Rome to negotiate a, a deal. Now, the deal for, for Henry is obviously no change to what's currently happening. Anselm is permitted to hold a reforming council as part of the deal um, that's created. But there isn't a formal decision that's made at this particular point of what to do with lay investiture. Anselm's uh, counsel is, is what he's been hoping for uh, for a number of years now. Ten years previously under the reign of William II, he wanted to hold these reforming councils, very similar to what Archbishop Lanfranc had done. Um, and in those councils, clerical marriage and simony are condemned. Again, it just seems to be a bit of deja vu uh, when we're, we're thinking about what Archbishop Lanfranc did in his reforming councils. In 1103, um, we do have a bit of a shift though. Henry pressures bishops into homage and lay investiture. He's not softening his stance whatsoever. And alongside his chief advisors, particularly um, you know, his, his closest advisor, a man called Robert of Moulin, and we'll talk about him in a second, um, they're really pushing this issue. And Anselm, doing exactly what Anselm has done in the past, gets incredibly angry about this, gets frustrated, and goes into self-imposed exile. That obviously raises the tension uh, now between the church and Henry. And in 1104, Pascal sends a, a veiled threat in a letter to Henry. Uh, in that letter, he wishes him health, uh, honour and, and victory. But he also gives him a warning at the same time. Now, that warning is, is veiled, um, but it's a warning that you can't ignore if, if, if the Pope has sent it to you as king and what he says is he says that those who do not hold the grace of Christ may feel Christ's sword instead now we know at this time that there's been a number of well there's, there's obviously been the first crusade um crusade idea is, is is quite popular in the 12th century and obviously we'll look at that when we look at our crusades unit um and it, you know it's it's not completely unheard of um at this particular time to perhaps think that a pope might take on a, um, a country um, because it's trying to extend, extend its power. And as a consequence to this, by 1105, Henry has to relinquish. Henry has to bow down to this, this kind of pressure. Um, it's also uh, raised by the fact that the church attack, not Henry himself in the first instance, but his chief advisor, Robert, um, and they excommunicate him. Now, excommunication is essentially saying that his soul is beyond salvation um, and that 
they're saying that no matter how many uh, how much money he's paying um to to um to different bishops he cannot save his soul um and he was specifically excommunicated for continuing to urge henry to use the practice of lay investiture so if they're excommunicating robert henry's next on that hit list so 1104 and 1105 the the tide really shifts in favor of the church through their aggressive stance and their aggressive policy and in 1106 we see a personal reconciliation between Henry and Anselm, and it's at Beck, which is where Anselm's um, abbacy is. So this is done on the church's terms, not on Henry's terms. And a deal is struck in 1106. And you might find that this deal sounds quite familiar. The deal is that the king gave up his right to investiture, but retained the right to receive homage from his bishops. And that's exactly what the, the original deal was in 1101. So the deal that uh, Henry was was given in 1101 is the deal that they make in 1106. And it's not a bad deal for, for all sides. So for the church, they've, uh, they're able to get rid of this idea of lay investiture. So it's a council of bishops and abbots and the pope that will decide who um, the bishops for different areas in England are. Um, but the king still has the right to receive homage. So still retains a degree of loyalty and um, and uh, of homage over those particular abbots and as a consequence in 1107 when this decision is ratified so that's made uh, made uh, practice at the Concordat of London um, it, it is the case that Henry still has influence over appointments so even though lay investiture um, you know the, the the abolition of lay investiture means that the the king uh, doesn't have the right solely to decide who his bishops and archbishops are he still has influence so for example um, William Warrell West um, is the uh, the Bishop of, of Exeter he's a trusted advisor of Henry and Henry of, of Bois uh, the Bishop of uh, Winchester so I think I said William uh, Warrell West was the Bishop of Winchester he's the Bishop of Exeter when Henry of Bois who's the nephew uh, of, of Henry the first uh, is made Bishop of Winchester he's clearly got people who are trusted advisors in those key positions so even though um, the issue of lay investiture is won necessarily by the church it's not a bad deal for Henry at all and in terms of reform it's more of a technicality and a symbolic tact that the church have won on when it comes down to the practicalities making sure that people um, are, are, are who are in the church are, are closely linked to him Henry hasn't lost out here so to finish off with, uh, I've got a few questions that I'd like you to think about and I'd like to come up with some answers for. The first is how did Henry I effectively end this controversy? Um, is it down to his own skill? Was he forced into this particular issue? And then secondly, it is, is something that's going to help you out for when you, you attempt your 20 market. So of the three Norman kings who successfully resisted reform of the, the church, um, which of the... Um, which of those particular Norman kings was the most successful whilst limiting the damage? So with William I, William II and Henry I, out of the three of them, who successfully resists reform of the church the most whilst limiting the damage? So it's a two-part question when you're thinking about that. The homework for the 4th of June is your 20 marker. So it's really important that you do that. If you've got any questions, any problems with that, please just get in contact. Thanks very much for listening.